welcome. Welcome to BART Online Worship and welcome once again to my allotment in Closley. We have been focusing and underlining the five marks of mission, a way of measuring the effectiveness of our church. Can you remember what they are? They all begin with T, tell, teach, tend, transform and treasure. And today we're going to focus on tend, tending. And Peter later will explain as he addresses us and brings us God's word from the scriptures. And by tend, we speak of the need to respond to human need by loving service. Let's praise God. Let's thank him. It's a glorious day. It's the middle of February. The sun is shining. Plants are beginning to sprout from the ground. It's fantastic. Praise God.
so our theme for today is one of those five marks of mission, tend. How do we tend the people around us? How do we tend, how do we look after, how do we love those within our church and those outside our church? Well, here I am once again in my allotment on this glorious sunny day in February. Um, as you can see, parts of it need tending. I've got lots of rubbish here which I need to get rid of. Um, and that's probably here only just a, a, a tenth of, of what's left. I've done most of it others. I've got here some uh, pictures of the ground which is in preparation some plants that are struggling on um, <laughs> my mate Dave is over the over the back here laughing at me so I'll just switch this off so welcome everyone <laughs> some geese they need tending they need looking after this water is a bit grubby it's, it's changed very frequently I think almost daily and as soon as it's changed they get in they wash themselves and it becomes muddy again and it needs changing and they need tending they need looking after. One of the three donkeys here on the farm again. They need looking after. They need tending. They won't survive without love and care. These are strawberry plants from which I've taken cuttings and I did that at the end of last year or towards the end of last year but this one here is struggling and guess why because I haven't looked after it I haven't tended it and Rita most years divides and propagates her African violets and this one also is struggling. We don't know why because she's good at tending it but this one seems to have gone by the by. I think this is where the expression happy as a piggy muck comes from. They do need tending, they do need feeding. They can't look after themselves. This is one of the alpacas on the farm. Uh, there are several of them and <laughs> they need tending. They need looking after. You may well have seen these before. Christmas trees. And I want to show you this one. This was almost dead about five years ago but about four years ago I put it in the ground and I tended it and it has revived I think this will eventually grow to a very tall tree which we can use once again Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. saying, Master, Master, we perish.
Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Calming the storm. In our reading today, we heard about a storm on the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias, Lake Gennesaret and Lake Kinneret. Steve was speaking to us two weeks ago about our holidays over many years to Maubisson in France on the southern shore of Lac de Carcon, which like Galilee is known by a different name at the other end. Like daughter. He described our exploration of the lake and the terracotta fort at Autun that disappointingly turned out to be an aging apartment block covered in terracotta tiles. Steve and I have enjoyed sailing together for many years and we had some fantastic sailing each summer on those trips. I learned to sail when I was at primary school because our vicar had two wooden sailing dinghies, a wayfarer and a mirror, which needed stripping and sanding before repainting one Easter holiday. A friend from church and I helped with the work and we were rewarded by being taken to Alverstoke on the Solent where the boats were kept and taught to sail. I then went on church sailing weekends sailing at school, youth group sailing holidays to the Norfolk Broads and then at the College Sailing Club in Plymouth. Then in 1990, after a gap of a number of years, Helen and I decided to get a Dart 18 catamaran. She had sailed with her dad as a child and I was very keen for us to do this together. So we bought a Dart 18 and drove to a car park in Whitstable, put the boat together, rigged it and off we went, very fast in a straight line from the shore. I was confident in my sailing and Helen seemed very confident in me, until I tried to tack or turn the boat through the wind to go back. Catamarans, because of their width and V-shaped hulls, are difficult to tack compared with a monohull dinghy. So we had quite a few goes, but I was struggling. Then, rather like the story today, the clouds darkened, the wind increased, the sea grew choppy, and a squall came. I was having one of those dry mouthed moments of feeling quite out of my depth. And then I managed to turn the boat. The stronger wind caught the sails on the other tack and over we went. There we were a long way from shore in the water with an 18 foot catamaran on its side with one hull seven feet above the water. Now I knew the capsize drill. Well, I had read it in a book. But how much harder could it be than a dinghy? I remained calm and confidently told Helen what to do, even though inside I was actually pretty worried. And together we righted the boat and it was pretty straightforward. It went, fortunately, by the book, as they say. We clambered back on board and headed back. When we eventually returned to shore, I was feeling slightly shaky with the adrenaline, but Helen jumped off the boat with a great big smile and said, that was brilliant. You know, I had complete confidence in you. 
what I have learned over the years, having had more than a few dry mouth moments, is a total respect for the sea and the weather. The RNLI constantly deal with people who are inexperienced or ill-equipped, but even for the most experienced, conditions can change rapidly and equipment can fail. Although we haven't needed them yet, I am always extremely grateful for that volunteer force who would risk their lives to help us if we were in difficulty. So here were the disciples, a bunch of very experienced fishermen who must have seen and been through and managed all variety of weather conditions on the Sea of Galilee, with Jesus sailing to the other side of the lake. Jesus, exhausted by the crowds, had fallen asleep and a squall came down on the lake that was so severe it swamped the boat and they were in great danger. It was clearly an extreme event because despite all their experience, they were afraid they were going to drown. Jesus must have been tired because in all the mayhem he was still asleep. They shook him awake in their fear, shouting through the wind and the crashing water, Master, Master, we're going to drown. These experienced fishermen were out of their depth in more ways than one. But they turned to Jesus because in that situation where everything was out of control, they believed he would be able to save them. And we read that Jesus got up in verses 24 and 25, rebuked the wind and the raging waters, the storm subsided and all was calm. He then asked his disciples, where is your faith? Considering what they had been through, that seems a bit harsh to me. But some commentators believe that he had taught them and that they were keen learners, so he was trying to move them on in their faith. And the lesson for us too today is the challenge to move on in our faith. All of us face trials, challenges, stresses and strains in our lives and they often take over our time and our thoughts, occupying us and taking our eyes away from Jesus and diluting our faith in God our Father. But too often, it's not until the dark clouds come and we face a real storm when something much more serious happens in our lives or in those we are close to that we realise how we have really sweated the small stuff unnecessarily. In those really tough times, in the heart of the storm, when the wind is deafening, the waves are crashing and the sea is raging, we will need God to be very close, to hold us, to comfort us, to sustain us, to walk alongside us and to help us to find a way through. Jesus calmed the storm for his disciples and he can calm the storms in our lives. He wants us to have faith despite the desperation and the overwhelming circumstances, whatever they may be. But we also need each other. We need to be there for those who are part of our fellowship, who we can see are struggling or facing challenges. We need to encourage each other, to uphold each other, to strengthen one another's faith and to support those with bigger problems than ours. We also need to see beyond our own fellowship to the wider community. I was really struck by the artwork that Sue showed us on Sunday of the crucified Christ among the abused, the enslaved, the bereaved, the prisoners and the poor. There are many in our own society facing poverty, anxiety, depression, abusive relationships, ill health, bereavement, broken families, unemployment, financial hardship, the list goes on. 
But we are called to be different and to make a difference. Two of the five marks of mission we keep going back to as a yardstick for our fellowship are important here. Tend and transform. We need to tend, to respond to human need by loving service, to be outward looking, to care for others in our fellowship and in the wider community. And we need to transform, to transform unjust structures of society, to challenge violence of every kind and to pursue peace and reconciliation, to confront injustice where we see it by taking action by speaking out and by getting involved. If we are to really bring that message of hope we celebrated less than two months ago at Christmas, we need to find our gifts and to use them, to build up our faith and to be the ears and eyes, the hands and the feet of Jesus, wherever we are and with whoever we meet. We need to respond with compassionate love, that agape love, that unconditional sacrificial love that Jesus showed on the cross. And now these three remain, faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen.
Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Do what's best. As above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're a blaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes.
Part of our mission as church is to tend those around us. We are called to act as Christ acted. He showed care for all, for the weak, the vulnerable. He tended his flock. He showed love and compassion. As we leave this place today, this service, wherever you are, may we each make a commitment to look around us and identify those in need. May we each step out in faith to love and care for all around us. And may we do that in the name and the love of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. So 
of creation giving praise to Christ alone. Stars will fade and mountains fall. Christ will shine forever. Love's unfading splendor. Earth and heaven will bow.